yourself and it's like so we had dinner last night yeah, exactly. <laughs> we were only three <laughs> uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, my name is Satish Babu and this is the workshop number eight uh, which is about the free and open source software in the context of defending the digital freedoms of the future uh, this is a breakout session as per the schedule we will look at the number of people in the hall before we actually break. Uh, if the number is actually uh, not so many, then we will prefer to uh, uh, continue in a serial manner the three topics. So we have identified three topics if you look at the, uh, which will be introduced shortly. So at this time, as people are trickling in, I'd like to request my panelists to introduce themselves in about 30 seconds. Uh, Sarah, can I start with you? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Kiden. I'm currently a Ford Mozilla Open Web Fellow. I'm attached to Research ICT Africa. Oh, we are working on a project on broadband performance and internet measurements, just trying to get uh, different studies from seven countries and then providing it to the public and trying to analyze it. I also wear other hats. In ICANN, I'm the secretary of AFRALO, which is African Regional at Large Organization. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Glenn McKnight. I'm the compliment to Sarah. Uh, I'm the secretary for Norello, which is the at-large North American organization. My pedigree on open source is twofold. One with IEEE on open hardware that we've worked on in terms of creating humanitarian open source uh, FOSS solutions, but also I've been involved for well over 10 years with ICT certification on, on open source um, projects, uh, whether Apache or uh, Postgres, and particularly Linux certification. Um, this is uh, Nico Echanis from Altermundi. Um, we work with community networks, as, um, specifically uh, developing software and hardware solutions, open source hardware and software solutions for community networks. Hi, my name is Mishi Chaudhry. I'm a technology lawyer. I'm also the legal director of the Software Freedom Law Center in New York. Uh, we represent the world's foremost uh, free and open source software projects, OpenSSL, Debian, um, and you name it, and we've represented them. I also am the president of SFLC.in, which is a legal services organization based out of New Delhi in India. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Olivier crepin Blanc. Uh, I've been an internet user since 1988, and I've been collecting hats ever since. So among all the hats that I've been collecting are chair of the European at-large organization, the counterpart of Sarah's and, uh, and uh, uh, Glenn's. Um, but I'm also chair of um, the uh, UK chapter of the Internet Society, um, also chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, and I'm a board member of the European Dialogue and Internet Governance, Eurodig, which is the European IGF. Um, I'll leave all the other hats uh, at home. Thanks. Hi, my name is Satish Babu. I am from India, uh, and I am a volunteer with ICANN, ISOC, and IEEE communities. Uh, I've been working uh, with open source since the late 90s, uh, and I'm the founding director of the International Center for Free and Open Source Software, uh, which is a government organization in India working on free software. Uh, me and uh, Another person, Judy, Judith Okite, who's not here today. Uh, we have been running this uh, open source workshops in IGF for the last f roughly four or five years. Uh, Judy could not make it today, uh, uh, but we have a very eminent uh, panelist, uh, uh, a very eminent panel here, so I'm glad for that. Uh, so that's about me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Panagiotis or Panos Antoniadis. I come from Greece, but uh, I live in Switzerland, in Zurich. I co-founded a non-profit organization. It's called NetHood. And uh, its objective is to create different forms of bridges between the um, physical and the digital, uh, between uh, community networks and uh, free software, free as in freedom, uh, between different common initiatives in the city, like cooperative housing, alternative currencies, and community networks, and also between the academia and the civil society. And uh, for this, we work in two European projects. One is called MAZI, meaning together in Greek, and the other, Net Commons. Hello, everyone. My name is Maureen Hilliard. I'm from the Cook Islands. Um, I'm just assisting here as a remote m moderator. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. So I'll very briefly outline the, the uh, sequence of uh, this workshop. Um, we will have Mishi, who will introduce to us the, the topic that we are going to discuss today. Uh, we will then break into three groups to discuss three aspects that we have identified, uh, which is the, the, uh, the relevance of uh, free and open source software uh, in terms of tools and technologies, uh, methodologies, processes, and best practices, and policy. So we will, uh, after the uh, presentation on the topic, we will split into three groups. There are three uh, leaders for this uh, three groups identified, uh, which are uh, Panayotis, Glenn, and Olivier, who will be leading the discussions. And the discussions will be for about 30 minutes. And then we'll come back here, and the group leaders will present the summary of the discussions. Uh, and then we'll have open discussions, and the, uh, you can raise any, any topic or comment at that point. Uh, and then we'll have closing comments by Sarah. Uh, if Judy and another speaker who's uh, to join us remotely, uh, Kivuwa. So these are the two speakers who are supposed to join us remotely. We are not sure whether they'll be able to do that. Both of them are from Africa. So depending on the connectivity, we hope to be able to get them to speak. So this is the uh, outline of this session. And I now request uh, Mishi to talk to us about the theme. Thanks, Satish. Um, I'm hoping everybody knows this is free as in freedom and not free as in free beer. Um, the topic itself is, um, as Satish said, he's been doing it for five years, but there's never a time that it's not relevant. Um, internet, the possibility of unlimited interconnection, a social condition in which we can all be connected to everyone else everywhere with rich technical connections that can allow us to produce services for one another. It was a tool of social development. It, was, it is supposed to be providing us one indivisible opportunity for everyone connected to it. As a tool of economic development, it is to allow people with little capital equipment but plenty of ingenuity to build effective businesses from zero. There were all these promises. The internet 
to educate every brain on earth, to empower those who have been left behind, to give voice to the voiceless, to increase productivity, to alleviate injustices, basically a panacea. Whatever happened to it? Well, we built a net right now, it seems, an internet which we do not want. And it seems so that we are stuck. We wanted a net that increased human potential by increasing human knowledge and creativity. Instead, now we have a net that is dominated by the collection of behavior, and it's used to stimulate artificial wants and artificial hatreds. That process is currently going around the world. I do not know, and I would leave it for you to decide whether the internet has actually failed its promise, but the problem may itself be too large for a solution because it's not just some arbitrary force, the net that's at fault. Uh, you can blame something like internet and it's all about it. But it's basically about us, um, the human race, which has built it. And the idea about using free software is that I do think that an ability and belief in free and open source software still gives us a chance to rescue it. And I'm going to ask you to challenge yourself because I think you can. I don't think that one can defend freedoms in the digital future without free software, mostly because everybody now understands that if your devices, which include this device, this device, your routers, or any other device you rely on to get accessibility, if you do not have control over your own devices, and if those devices are controlled by other people, then you won't have any digital freedoms in the, di in the 21st century. When I started working, and some of uh, the panelists here, uh, free and open source software was geeky, esoteric, somewhat cool. But I think now it is not only essential, but it's the only thing which is standing between us and freedom. Economically, we all know, in Professor Benkler's words, that private property, patents, um, free market are not the only way to organize our society efficiently. The commons, which is where the free and open source software comes from, offers us the most coherent alternative today. Why I said that devices are the ones which are going to tell us whether we are free in the 21st century or not, is just by some example. If a government chooses a policeman in every street corner in a province, and requires people to put spyware in their phones, forces them to download malware in their phones, there's not going to be any freedom. I don't need to spell out the country I'm referring to, but the city and the country where this is happening, we all know. Now, right to control the software that runs in your computers thereby becomes necessary for your own political liberty. In the beginning of the free and open source software movement, People did not understand why we said that. Everybody thought about just opening the code was important, but what was also important was the freedom and the ability to control your own computers and not let them control you. Without free and open source software, people assume that services also must be provided in a centralized way. That's why you see that the power these days is being concentrated in a few players. If all the email, for example, is handled by only two companies, or one of the two companies, then there is only two places that government has to go to read everybody's email. However, if everybody ran free and open source software to run their email servers on single board computers, Raspberry Pis, in their houses, then mass surveillance is much harder because then it doesn't scale at the same level. What I believe in, and I think what uh, everybody who works in the FOSS community talks and thinks about is that the more we can empower the citizens to run their own services and provide them to one another, the more we can prevent governments from using the concentration of technology to create concentration of power. The truth is, if these devices don't belong to you, you have no control over the software that runs them, and all services are prov provided centrally, then there is no freedom you can even think about or demand. And that's why everything which open source offers 
is not just about making better software, but also constructing a different society where we all can actually go back to the failed promise of the net and think about doing it a little differently. That is why I believe that the, that the workshop right now, and I would urge you all to have that as an underlying theme of the three breakout discussions which we would have, talk about everything, what it has done to education, what advertising has done to human mind, what social media has done to how we perceive things, how politics has been impacted, what are the good and the bad things which the machine learning of the neural networks is going to bring for us in our society, and how all of that can actually be used to get where we want it to be and not to stay where we currently are. Uh, thank you, Mishi. Uh, before I ask uh, Sierra to talk about the groups here, uh, Olivier has requested for a one-minute intervention, and uh, there's one more one-minute intervention after that. Thank you very much, Satish. Olivier Crepin-Ablon speaking. And I just wanted to add a little historical and technical element to what you've said, Mishi. Um, the first, or the, actually the second implementation of TCP IP for small computers that really started to get the internet to go out there instead of just being run by big organizations, but actually having individuals and people in developing countries to be able to use the internet was KA9Q. How many people have heard of KA9Q? It was the uh, radio handle of a gentleman called Phil Karn and many different uh, first internet nodes in countries, developing countries, and even in de developed countries, running on a PC ran K9Q, and that was, that was open source. How many people have heard of Apache? A few more people, yeah. So that came up a lot later, and that's a web server software that is open source that used to power up to 70% of the world's web servers. And it is in decline because there are other web server uh, um, uh, software now that are in use, but it still is the most prevalent web server software out there, and it is open source. So that's the significance of open source uh, to, uh, to the internet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olivier Satish, for the transcript. Um, I would like to add on a minute's uh, uh, thing here, which is to do with what Mishi mentioned towards end, uh, the whole issue of algorithms, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and what that brings to as a challenge to the open source community. Uh, the open source community uh, could defend our freedoms by reviewing, reviewing auditing, uh, modifying the source code. Now, when you talk about a neural network, uh, the, the engine that drives these algorithms are actually a combination of uh, code and data. It is data that primes the engine, it continues to uh, improve it, refine it over a period of time. And this data is not something that we can easily edit or review. We want to tweak the results. For example, there is a racial bias in some of the algorithms that are used, or at least there's a claim that there is a racial bias. Now, there's no tweak, or there's no race, race button there to tweak, really. So then what is the community going to audit? How are you going to uh, ensure that we can uphold our freedoms? These are new challenges that are being uh, brought in. At this point, I request Sarah to tell us about the group's division, and then we will move on to the groups. So we are going to break out into three groups, and the first group will be looking at tools and technologies provided by open source technologies. So you're looking at things like operating systems, access tools, uh, blockchain technology, peer-to-peer -peer technologies, just anything that can enable the safe use of the internet. I think they'll sit over there, and they'll be headed by Pana Yotis. Then group number two, uh, with Glenn, we'll be talking about methodologies and processes in dealing with uh, content generation. So they'll sit maybe somewhere here. So we are looking at languages. Do you deliver the content on mobile, on desktop, things like that? You'll sit here. And then group number three, we'll talk about policy initiatives that enable people to connect using open source technologies. And that will be Olivier over here. Then we'll discuss for 30 minutes, and I'll come and remind you when we have 10 minutes to go. Then we'll converge, and we'll get just the key highlights in about five minutes from each group. Sure. So group one is over there. Panayotis. 
tools and technologies. Then group number two here with Glenn. That's methodologies, policies, best practices, processes, I'm sorry, processes. Processes, best practices. Then group number three here, that's policies with Olivier.
a license for internet or a browser. I mean, that's what uh, so the next group wanted to do. They wanted to sell the browser for ICU. They wanted to sell it for all the for everything. And then Microsoft and Google are developing into the And so it's, 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 it's,
that the architecture is here and the problem is we cannot, A, we cannot do coding on this, on this device. So what we've lost is the education to teach our young girls and young people who are going to do this. We need to be able to get into this device, change this device, not everybody, but at least the, you know, the new people who we are attracting. The young person who might come to our country to be able to do this. It's the same thing about everything else, the medical devices that we are being interested in. They are all people out of the ordinary who should not be able to do this. And as my son right here on Himalaya, we are going to buy these little stores, but they don't know what they are going to have to buy to know how to have to buy them. They don't know. That's why Microsoft is still fighting that thing with their life cycle and it's like, okay, this is not coming to here anymore. My servers are not here. They're in Ireland. You say your jurisdiction extends to wherever my servers are. Because if I'm Microsoft and I have data about the Middle East, then you should be able to find me. And Microsoft says, if no US company gets access to it, every other thing will demand the same thing from you. And the companies are interested in that. How do they open the switch to everything with cloud and data laptops and doing all of that? If again they have to do the data localization, something fails here, so we can do to 10,000 people.
Uh, can we get back to the room, please? Be seated.
Can I uh, uh, ask the, uh, the, the group leader, the first uh, group, which is uh, Paneotis, to give us a summary of uh, the discussions. Uh, each uh, group leader has five minutes to present the summaries. Hello. So we were a complementary group uh, working around uh, ideas of uh, free uh, software and uh, tools in general. So there were two people from Belarus, Vlad and Svetlana, that have a non-profit organization that tries to uh, activate and inform and train people in using open source software. Uh, they do this both by presenting it as something better, actually, more comfortable, more better to use, but also about the vision of the future, the freedoms, etc. They follow an incremental approach. They don't want to scare people. And this is also related to what Sarah told us from uh, Uganda, uh, where they have a university that it's, uh, has uh, achieved today more than 90% of use of free software. And uh, exactly one of the um, lessons learned from this process is that we don't have to be very radical and say to people, throw away your uh, uh, Microsoft and Apple, but build this uh, knowledge and this uh, critical mass uh, step by step. It was a very nice example, for example, that they focus first on the server room, educating the technicians first to be confident with this technology for people afterwards to have uh, people close by that they can help them. We were also lucky to have in the group somebody that declared uh, that uses Windows actually, and it's from the NGO that it's very uh, positive to such technologies, but they don't have the skills and uh, what they can do. I mean, so, uh, and this is also what the organization from um, Belarus, uh, it's called uh, Falanster, uh, tries to do, actually tries to bring together NGOs that are very positive to using free tools with activists, digital activists, to create these complementary relationships. And then I talked uh, about my projects that we try actually to, uh, to, to focus on the idea of freedom, not as a binary, but as something that could be more or less free. So for example, there are software that are easier or more difficult to uh, host and to customize. And we want to combine this uh, self-hosted software with the community networks. Nico, I guess, will say more about them. So combining free software with free net networks actually is the base of creating what I call net diversity. So we need diversity as we need bio biodiversity. And these tools, because they can uh, be rooted on urban spaces, because the net, both the network and the software live together, uh, it creates the right conditions. And for this, I, there are two European projects. One is Net Commons working on the network, and Mazi working on the software. Uh, focusing on the customization and the, uh, exactly empowering people to use all this free software to define their own uh, local hybrid spaces. And then another dimension is learning. So another software, open source software that we work, it's called OpenKey, and uh, it tries to create what Ivan Illich called the learning webs. We hear a lot in IGF about training the trainers. So there is this tool, it's a new and under development that tries exactly to facilitate this type of learning webs. And uh, another very important dimension is the language. So I am an advocate uh, for the organic internet as a contrast to the algorithmically modified data that Facebook and Google uh, provide. And it's very important to create such narratives for pe people can relate and create analogies. So as we have genetically modified organisms, we have also algorithmically modified data, and we should find ways to build the internet in a more grassroots and organic uh, way. Yes. 
Yes, and I forgot uh, Lydia who came at the end and it's an example of somebody that searches for tools and an example, a good area, it's uh, this idea of creating interfaces with public services and the community. So very simply put, uh, how we can build smart cities not with top-down uh, commercial software that captures all the data of the city and the citizens, but through free software that can be transparent and can enable uh, participation at uh, all levels. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the summary. We now move on to the second group. Uh, Glenn will talk to us about the methodologies. Great, thank you, and thanks for all the people who are still staying with us. Um, we had a, an interesting dialogue, and at the very end, we said, what's our purpose again? Oh, a methodology, so we had the circle. <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk more about our case studies in a second, but I just wanted to emphasize, and many of the same things that uh, was just mentioned uh, resonate with us as well. And we, we, um, we kept going back to the fact on, on if we're looking at methodologies that actually will increase the probability of adoption, we needed to look at the fact that FOSS has huge benefits. And the question is, how do you market th these benefits? How do you convince people that there is something intrinsically valuable in, in, um, for this adoption? And so one of the things that we uh, spoke about is investing in your local community. The fact that when you spend money in uh, FOSS solutions, it's actually staying in the community. It's building capacity in the community. It's actually looking at, um, it's very patriotic in many ways. It's not spend, sending uh, money to uh, foreign IT companies, but it's basically keeping the per person who's working on your computer that's doing that specialized programming is somebody who's perhaps teaching your children soccer in your local community. It's a person who's maybe uh, uh, doing the small little uh, business down the street where you, you buy your vegetables. So it, it really is a pride of place in that we, we as, a, as a, a best practice, as a methodology, we need to realize that we need to give decision makers tools to make decisions to overcome those inherent barriers that, that pop up. They automatically say, where's the support? You know, you're not a big company. If you ever read your EULA, you don't own that software, and they don't support it really. But you know, they, they, it's, a, it's a natural thing that they criticize us saying you're just small potatoes. So I think we need to look at uh, ways of overcoming that resistance. And I shared with everybody our experience over 10 years ago when Evan Lebovich and I ran the Linux Professional Institute. We went to the Ontario government who was seriously looking at implementing open source software across the board. And the bureaucrat sat back and he leaned back and he says, hell will freeze over before we adopt open source. <laughs> so we knew that we had a challenge. So we, we looked at best practices in, in different countries and what Nico shared with us is the Libra router and Nico's right beside me and uh, he's based in Argentina and the, uh, the, this is an extremely important solution and, and it's, it's a device that's used in mesh networking. It has many other features that you don't get in your TP-Link, your Ubiquiti your other devices or microtech. I'm very interested in seeing this and it's going into the next phase of the prototype by January. So uh, price points are very comparable, uh, but it's an, and they're struggling with the license. They don't ne necessarily using TARP or an open harbor license, but it's a evolution. Uh, but it's something that one should bear in mind. I shared with the group my project that we did with IEEE because we said when we looked at humanitarian challenges, what software, we want to make all our solutions, uh, our best practices open sourced, but they really never had an open source license before. So we actually worked with a group called We Care Solar and it was a solar suitcase. Okay, just imagine a suitcase that has solar panels in it, walkie talkies, it has flashlights and it's for maternity wards. And, and Laura Satchel, she's an obstetrician from uh, Oakland, her husband is from Berkeley, and these students in his class would make these suitcases. People would go to Nigeria and different places and give the suitcase 
to the nurses and the doctors and those maternity wards, and it had a direct impact on the lives of those women. And she was awarded the CNN award because of it, but it was an open source license that we worked with IEEE on this project. We talked about Open Moco, but none of us really knew what happened with that. And Open Mesh Network, Nico shared with us on that. And what was very interesting, Serge. Serge says in the Congo, he's working with small business communities. They're getting donated uh, computers from Total, the oil company out of France. And they're working in, in a very grassroots kind of model where the methodology is taking the computers putting open source software on it, putting Linux and other applications and working uh, with the community. And, and they identified different sectors. Agricultural sector, was Serge was saying, was one of the big things. But, uh, and we also talked with Regina, who's back there from Cuba, and, and uh, you know, what do you do when you have a country which has been, has suffered an embargo for so many years um, that, you know, what do they have? Well, they have, clever techniques which are called sneakerware. So pirated software is very common. And, and so that's another challenge for us to have countries adopt open source software and FOSS uh, so when you have rampant use of, of pirated software. So that's for us. Thank you, Glenn. We now move to Olivier for the third group on policy. Uh, thank you, uh, Satish Olivier Kapanabla speaking. So I've written a lot of notes and I'm going to go through them. They might be a little disjointed at, at the moment, but I think it provides a good record of what we were discussing. Policy has implications with legislation, legal affairs, etc., and governments, of course. So most of our discussions uh, turned around what governments were doing in our uh, respective parts of the world. There really are two sides to this. Uh, argument. There are those governments that actively promote free software and uh, that see that uh, free software is very important. And there are others that are a bit more cold towards the promotion of free software and free and open source software, of course, uh, because they might have some stakes in the game as far as their industry is concerned. Often, uh, you have countries that point in a certain direction until they receive lobbying from corporate organizations, um, large corporations. Uh, pushing uh, for the uh, notion that the market will decide at the end of the day. Uh, we had several examples, uh, DG Connect, for example, having the uh, next-gen internet, which is very much pro-open software. Other departments were asking uh, for uh, Europe to create the next unicorn. You know, we need to have big European software companies out there uh, and that, of course, doesn't work very well with open source. So we had this um, the whole thing of open source costs that cannot be recouped when a commercial organization can undercut uh, the software costs by actually providing free software as part of uh, their big offering. We're of course talking about the likes of Microsoft and Google and the big global corporations that are able to uh, um, basically offer a lot of services for free because they're making the money elsewhere. Some countries develop their own policies, uh, sorry, their own monopolies to close off their market. We've seen that in Russia, for example, in China as well, where they develop their own um, software companies and, and services and so on. Um, and governments see the economic benefit for corporations. So they are sometimes lukewarm about open source because they can't see an, an actual thing for their own industry. Um, they also see the potential to be able to control commercial software more than uh, to control open source software. Um, especially when it comes down to local, implement uh, local implantation of that corporate organization. So let's say Microsoft um, being present in Switzerland, for example, um, the local government sees it that it's more, it's easier to control whatever Microsoft doing in Switzerland because Microsoft wants to be there, just as an example. Uh, we had an example of Munich um, pushing for open source, but yet the schools were all using proprietary software and we're teaching the use of proprietary software. And so the uh, city rolled back their policy because of the public outcry. Um, uh, sorry, rolled back their policy due to commercial installation of large proprietary software company. So originally they were promoting open source, but then uh, that large company decided they were going to put some uh, 
headquarters there and that would provide jobs and employment and maybe it was uh, a good idea for the city at that point to roll back and to say, hey, we'll use your software instead. Um, we spoke about hardware perhaps as open source and with a Taurus router being a good prospect. Um, we also had a discussion on a case in India in Tamil Nadu for free laptops that had proprietary software that were uh, uh, given over to schools and so on, but that was actually rolled back. So this is a case where we started with proprietary equipment that then got push, uh, pushed back from the public and from the public outcry uh, on that. And so that got specific uh, officials in the government to, do, to look at this and to reverse their, uh, uh, their, their views and therefore reverse the policy. In Geneva, most people elected are pro-open source and free software. The commercial lobbies are not that strong, but yet the tools for the schools in Geneva, which are actually not run by the, uh, by the, the town itself, um, from the search engine to the other tools, they're all in the cloud. Uh, they're all provided by a single uh, commercial provider, and that's of course because they're free when they're provided in the cloud. And that's when we uh, um, saw that the individual officials might be pro-open source, but the reality of it is that it's not being implemented because non-open source is free, whilst open source is not in, in many cases, which is really strange when you, when you look at it. But open source does have to recoup some costs at some point, while those big companies don't need to because, as I said earlier, they can do it elsewhere. The largest barrier is, uh, in, in some cases, and it's still the case now, and I've heard that before, was the non-availability of easy GUI, so graphical user interface uh, tools, yep, yeah, I'll be quick, uh, for teachers and assistants, but then we found out that in India, in fact, there was a, a lot of open source software being distributed in schools, and the teachers uh, ended up being the programmers and developing the tools for, for easy use for their, uh, uh, for their students. Um, we looked at commercial contract with big multinational corporations that include technical support. That was seen as something that we don't have a problem with anymore these days because the very large corporations don't do that much te technical support, except when striking specific case scenarios. Um, and then we moved to data because the money today is not made in software, the money is made in data, and this is where there is no legislation or regulation. There is going to be some with the GDPR coming up, General Data Protection Regulations, but that's a, another uh, chapter. But so far, the data is seen as where the money is going to be made. The software is not becoming that important anymore. So we're hoping that uh, uh, the, the, this whole battle about open source and so on will, will ease in some way. There was discussion ar about artificial intelligence and promoting the uh, uh, open data licenses. Um, and we then also had some um, discussion about uh, from GitHub uh, policy with uh, um, the work that took place over in the US where there was a battle between Congress and uh, the Senate uh, with the uh, sort of next le level of software updates uh, for the Department of Defense that uh, originally did not have anything um, that was limiting the use of open source. In fact, the official thing is we have to push for open source by default, um, but uh, then it gave rise to some kind of a compromise that the Department of Defense needed to follow general US government regulations on open source, which is that 20% of the code should be open source and the rest of it uh, can be proprietary. No legislation so far, um, as I said, regarding data. Um, so GDPR is probably what we're going to be discussing next, next year, and open data probably is one of the big topics uh, then. And ideally, uh, we should make sure that uh, everyone should be able to choose their own storage, where they want their stuff stored, their information stored, with local storage for personal data, and some kind of a licensing system for the cloud providers to be able to point to that data without actually having control of it themselves because it gets very difficult to know where that data is and we, we've seen that. So free services are more difficult to address. There's a potential for sh uh, shaping a fair way to use uh, computing resources. So instead of making the money on the data, uh, those companies that provide those services could make use of our spare cycles and our computers. Um, but there's no legislation on this. Uh, no regulation as such. 
So it's still a very open case scenario. Um, but we all have to push for um, the diversity of services and resources uh, rather than the focalization that we often see in users. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Olivier. This is Satish for the transcript. Uh, before we open up for discussions, uh, I'd like to request uh, Nico to, to speak to us uh, for five minutes. Okay. Um, what I have been mostly worried about or trying to work with in, in, in the past months is the concept of um, the, the right to co-create the internet. And w whenever I'm listening to, to this uh, kind of uh, thing, I come back to the same. Um, what, is it, what is it? What is this right to co-create the internet? We are always discussing about access in this sort of forums. And access is a concept that is uh, looking at the users as consumers, as consumers, no? So you can access a service uh, and you, you will download data, you will watch video, et cetera, but you're not a peer in the network, you're a consumer. And this is something that is so embedded that, for example, in network ne neutrality discussions, we never discuss the, the worst discrimination that already exists everywhere, which is the bandwidth discrimination for upload and download bandwidth. So my concern is that even if we create more peer-to-peer -peer software, even if we do more work for people to adopt locally hosted services in their embedded devices, Raspberry Pis, what not, uh, they will still have uh, connectivity problems to actually be able to provide ex effective uh, services and contents uh, locally. So I think this is something we need to push for uh, hard. Like, uh, and that's why I'm I, I relate this to, I don't know if you are aware of the debates um, regarding uh, food security and food sovereignty. No, this, these are two concepts that are speaking about something similar. It's people, uh, people's food, but one is top down, food security is top down. It's, uh, we need to feed everyone. And food sovereignty is speaking about empowerment, is speaking about our right to self-determination as to what food we are producing, what food we are consuming, and how we are doing all of this. And related to this is uh, that I think the right to access is similar to the uh, food security vision and the right to co-create the internet is related to the f uh, food sovereignty vision. Uh, and I think that we grassroots organizations in the civil society need to push for this concept because otherwise most of what we're working, working for is disabled at another layer. No? We can uh, have success at many layers but then the network uh, layer is not enabling and then we are not really able uh, to do what we, what we intend to do. That's what uh, I wanted to share with this. Uh, thank you, Nico Satish, for the transcript. That is a very interesting uh, take on uh, co-creation of the internet itself. Uh, now we are opening the floor for open discussions, any comment or uh, point that uh, we have missed out, you're free to please speak. Please identify yourself as you speak. Uh, yeah, any questions? Yes, please. This work, yeah. Martin schmalz from uh, Families Europe. Uh, I just wanted to come back to this uh, notion of, of um, I would say, that, like 
data, <laughs> data sovereignty, data security, if you will. Um, I think the issue is in the food, it's obviously an economic phenomenon. I mean, if you have food security, you don't have food sovereignty because your market is flooded with you know, food from outside, subsidized often, which kills the, the local industry. But with information and data, it's not the problem of producing the data, it's the problem of finding it. And so you have, right now, you have portals to access the internet, which are the Googles and the Facebooks, which sort of narrow the access to the data that is available. So even though you, as an individual in whatever country, you do have some data that is available, you are sharing it, it sort of, sort of gets drowned in, you know, via these kind of filters. Uh, and so I think it's, it's more important not to, to, to look at the creation side, but more the discovery side and to make sure that the tools that are available, like any portal that accesses the internet has to have a certain amount of features to enable discovery. So you should have the option, for instance, to see, you know, just maybe restrict my search to whatever is in, you know, I don't know, 20 kilometers of where I live to support local artists, to support, and you can generalize this to everything, even concerts, even music, even art, even, you know, goods and services, food, everything. And it, it only takes, um, the fact to embed that feature, the feature doesn't exist, you'll never be able to use it. And so it's, it's about making sure that these kind of features that enable this, this discovery are available and are, are, are included in the tools that we use to access. Thank you. Uh, so one, two, three, please go ahead. Yes, thanks for the question. I think it's very important. And I think uh, Nico, in the, where he works with the community nat uh, networks, they offer a very natural way to discover things, as you mentioned, because some of them are, not some of them, all of them are physically constrained. So you could have a very natural way to find things that actually live also as digital services in your area. And myself, I'm an advocate also of bringing these networks to the ground, because now they are all live in the <laughs> roofs. Uh, and I think it's very important discovery and trust to be created also face to face. And exactly such networks, because they are addressed to people that live close, they have the chance that the people that use the network, that manage the network, can even meet together and see their faces. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I, I just want to share with you uh, on the data issue. Dr. Andrew Clements, a University of Toronto professor, wrote a um, paper uh, on national sovereignty issue because all the email in Canada goes through Chicago. So if it, your Canadian email goes through Chicago, it now becomes subject to the NSA, the National Security Act. So from a national sovereignty point of view, that pisses us off, right? So because you could end up having to be subject to U.S. law, which, again, that's pretty annoying uh, from, from a small country like ourselves that we'd have to be subject to an NSA. So that's a whole issue that we have to address. And then you guys in Europe are ahead of the game on, on the right to be forgotten and the GDPR. And, uh, you know, we're, we have a long way to go on that one. So um, I, I'm quite concerned about, you know, these, these data farms and, and very large U.S. corporations. They're in another game, you know, Amazon services and whatnot, and they're making money on your data. You know, and, and again, that, that is something countries have to start thinking about seriously. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Nico, please. Um, no, I just wanted to, to mention regarding this that I see this, this problem of internet co-creation in layers. No? You have those uh, physical and infrastructure layer, this, uh, this uh, logical layer, and there's a content layer. And we should work on all of those layers to enable co-creation. And there are hindrances in every layer, and we need to remove the ba barriers in every layer. So, and it makes sense for it to be more organic. You could have a Google software that will tell you about the uh, music, uh, the, the, the musician that lives right uh, next door. But it would really make, make much more sense if that were a peer-to-peer -peer software telling you that, you know, 
that it doesn't have to go around the world, that you yeah. just know the musician right. is, is next door through a network that connects you directly to him and through a logic that is deciding this peer-to-peer -peer and Google doesn't know about it, yeah. doesn't need to know. Uh, thank you, Nico, Satish, for the record. Uh, we have time for one, one more question, maybe. Yes, please. So I only just, uh, I arrived rather late, so I'm sorry if this has been brought up. But um, speaking of the GDPR and like you being ahead of the game in many, uh, many things, there are also some uh, fairly worrying developments going on right now. There is the copyright reform which is currently like in process, and uh, uh, especially Article 13, which is about uh, requiring basically all internet platforms. The definition is very vague, and as it stands, the uh, uh, internet pla all internet platforms that um, uh, store uh, large amounts of user uploaded content. And as it stands, this definition would cover code sharing platforms. Uh, such as GitHub. So uh, this means all the code anyone uploads to these services would be subject to automatic like pre-screening and filtering. So like any reflections on this possibly? Uh, thank you very much. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Maya Lira Odeskoski and I'm uh, here with the copywriters, a group of young people who are advocating for a better copyright reform. Thank you very much. Would any of the panelists oh. like to respond? I know, we've got to get to uh, Yeah, so would you like to respond, please? Sure. I'm Abby Vollmer from GitHub, and thank you very much for that comment, because it is something that is very top of mind for us. Um, we are really concerned about the language and um, our, well, we've joined um, open, I'm blanking on the name, open, no, share code EU. Um, which is Open Forum Europe and the Free Software Foundation's uh, in Europe's effort to get groups together about the impact of the copyright directive on open source. Um, so there's a white paper and we have a GitHub as a quote in there and a bunch of other companies as well. Um, so please look at that and learn a little bit more about it. But um, I think I'll just take the opportunity to maybe reiterate the point that I made in the group, the group session. Um, more and more we see a lack of full understanding by policymakers about the, the scope of the words that they're using when they're trying to address issues related to technology. And so even though you know the traditional notions of copyright are probably aimed towards music and videos and that sort of thing, the language is sweeping up code um, and so this just shows the need to really um, help people understand how technology works <laughs> and how open source software you know, is essential and shouldn't be compromised by this effort to um, really correct uh, this targeted effort on other forms of copyright. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, noting that our time's up, I'd like to, as I request uh, Sarah to uh, wind up the meeting, uh, I'd like to say that uh, we're going to take a group photo of everybody in the room just after Sarah finishes. Over to you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we would like to especially thank you who have stayed until the end. I think we've learned a lot from the discussions and also from uh, learning from the other groups as well. So this discussion continues. Of course, we cannot go back and say now we're going to go open source, but the discussion continues, and then we can, con we can continue to help each other so that we all adopt uh, open source technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you.